Hi, everybody. Uh, I'm London Epicheco George from the Heinz Institute for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. And today, with the partnership of Dr. Rosado, we're here with a guest speaker as part of our eTalk series at the Heinz Institute. Kind of hopefully, we would gonna listen to Dr. Petrusili. Am I saying it correctly or I'm butchering your name? You're muted. Sorry, John. Sorry. I said you're very close, actually. It's Petroselli. Petroselli. Thank you. Um, and, you know, he'll talk a little bit about his experience and sort of maybe an entrepreneurial pathway that he has taken. Um, so with no further ado, uh, Dr. Rosado, I'll let you introduce him officially. All right. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to introduce uh, one of the most uh, accomplished and really singular and talented uh, young voices on the jazz scene today, Dr. John Petroselli. Uh, he is a wonderful saxophonist and composer, originally from New Jersey, uh, came up in the New York scene, uh, has also played around New Orleans, graduated with his doctorate in jazz studies from the University of Pitt. Uh, his albums have been incredibly well received critically. Um, and as I said, he's worked with uh, sort of a who's who of artists that is really uh, a great group of people to collaborate with. And recently got a very wonderful commission from uh, Disney Pixar, which is going to be the subject of his talk today. So in addition to his own albums as a leader, you can find his music on the promotional album for the recent hit movie Soul. Uh, and with that, Dr. Petroselli, I will let you take it away. Well, thank you both so much for having me this evening and welcome to everyone who's joining us uh, via Zoom this evening. Wow. Thank you all so much for your interest and uh, for uh, tuning in with us this evening. Uh, before I begin, you know, there's innumerable people who uh, make my being here possible. This evening. And certainly I want to uh, thank and acknowledge the Heinz Institute for Entrepreneurship and Innovation. Number one, for allowing me to be here to share my experiences this evening. And number two, for being open to uh, my discipline. You know, honestly, uh, there's, uh, I think sometimes a disconnect between the, the recognition of uh, the arts, and in particular uh, music uh, as an entrepreneurial activity and I certainly know from the musical side that there is not always the recognition or engagement with the fact that our art form is an entrepreneurial act. Um, you know, taking um, the onus and the responsibility of engaging uh, with our discipline uh, as a business practice and not uh, solely a creative enterprise. And again, on the other side, of that equation, I think uh, sometimes, you know, as entrepreneurs, as uh, people engaged in business, we don't always uh, give ourselves credit for the creative and flexible ways uh, that we have to en engage with our disciplines and our fields. So again, thank you to the Heinz Institute. Uh, thank you uh, to our hosts this evening. Again, it's much appreciated. And uh, perhaps uh, I can begin uh, by sharing with you what it is that I do, which is which is an art form. Uh, so I'd love to begin by just playing you a little something this evening and then talk about what it is that I'm doing um, when I'm playing for you, because uh, it's sort of the the main theme or uh, the the defining uh, attribute that I'm going to try and get across to you this evening is that the act of of doing something in your field can actually achieve multiple goals at the same time if you let it and if you plan it. So uh, maybe I'll, I'll get into this evening by, by playing and then I'll talk about what I'm doing when I am playing. Thank mm -hmm. you. 
Charlie Parker fan? Can anyone tell me what melody I was playing? Is that composition familiar by any chance? Okay, well, that is a composition entitled Just Friends. And um, the reason why I chose to play Just Friends is because later this month, <clears throat> I'm actually playing a recording session with uh, an orchestra that I've been um, I was never able essentially I've been asked to um, recreate the performance by Charlie Parker, who was this legendary bebop saxophonist from the early 1940s through the, the 1950s. Um, and essentially, uh he recorded this project called parker with strings i'd love to play you just a little excerpt of this so you can see where i'm coming from here <clears throat> hate to stop that recording. <laughs> um, so I'm actually going to play this piece with an orchestra. And um, essentially, I'm using this presentation as an opportunity, number one, to prepare for that. Number two, to let you know that that recording is coming. And the performance itself, actually, I've used something that I'm going to refer to again uh, toward the end of this presentation called plateauing, essentially trying to stack opportunities together and uh, essentially to give myself opportunities to achieve different goals simultaneously with one project. Um, in fact, I think you could you know, effectively argue 
that this presentation itself is a tier of a plateau um, and a plateaued project um, because essentially I'm here to talk to you about uh, a commission that has already happened, right? This composition and this performance uh, for the Disney Pixar movie, Soul. Um, so what I'd like to encourage all of you to do now and during the course of this presentation is think about when John is talking about jazz, compositions, recordings, right? Streams of income that, um, you know, that all relate to my world as a composer, educator, and saxophonist, right? How can you connect that to what you do, right? I know that we're all coming from different backgrounds, uh, from different fields of study, right? And, and we're at different points in terms of our path, uh, both as individuals and as uh, professionals, right? So what I wanna share with you tonight is um, how I've created my path and some of the, the critical decision points that I've had to uh, acknowledge and, and sometimes overcome um, during that path. But I think um, a large part of what I have to say to you this evening transcends genre and um, can be applied right in entrepreneurial way um, to what you do or are seeking to do. So maybe we can um, dive in and talk a little bit more specifically about that. So today, I, what I wanna talk to you about, right, the title of this presentation, When Dreams and Preparation Meet, or how I recorded an original composition for Disney Pixar, Soul in Five Days. Adam already did an amazing job. Dr. Rosado did an amazing job at, at uh, talking me up here. Um, but essentially, um, I wanted to put up the screen for you uh, because uh, I really hope that the conversation doesn't end here this evening. Um, so I'm giving you uh, my website, my uh, Instagram profile, my uh, Facebook fan page. Uh, for those of you who uh, would like to collaborate or uh, perhaps you know a question comes to you after this presentation is long over, um, I'd really love to, to stay in touch uh, via social media or uh, other forms of communication, uh, smoke signal, phone call, <laughs> whatever works for you. Um, but I think uh, at the top of this slide is something that's really important. It, and essentially that I have from, you know, over a decade ago now, established a sort of tripart approach to who I am in my field. That is saxophonist, composer, educator. And, you know, when I formed this uh, tripart structure, I had no idea exactly how that was going to translate in terms of a career. Um, you know, where my main sources of income were going to come from, revenue streams. Um, you know, it was all, I think, pretty nebulous to me when I started, started out. But um, I was introduced to the saxophone at a really early age. My dad was my first teacher and he started taking me out to the club scene uh, in New York and New Jersey uh, starting when I was around eight years old. Um, so I've been performing for a really, really long time in the genre that we, uh, you know, kind of loosely call jazz. Um, and Richie Cole, this amazing alto saxophonist uh, on the scene at the time, uh, was my primary mentor as I was coming up as a young kid. Um, so the saxophone and performance, live performance, was something that um, I was introduced to at a really early age. And I knew uh, that like this was something I could really like hang my hat on as a performer. Um, but the education and the composition elements came as I started developing sort of more than a saxophonist, but as an artist, you know, sort of generally speaking. Um, when I was studying at the University of Virginia for my undergrad, uh, I was a philosophy major, uh, but I was also like, 
highly involved in the jazz performance scene in Virginia and Washington, D.C. And so uh, I met a really wonderful uh, trumpet player and film score composer named Terrence Blanchard uh, when he was coming through. Uh, and that was when I started to realize that my interests, um, my interest in philosophy and my interest in performance actually weren't disparate at all, but actually they were highly connected. And the through thread was composition. So if you aren't aware of, of Terrence Blanchard, um, he was and still is the main compositional voice bet uh, for Spike Lee's uh, film scores. He's also scored now Princess and the Frog, Inside Man, I mean, a, a huge uh, oeuvre of, of musical collaborations in film now. But he started out as a jazz musician. And I didn't really realize until I met Terrence that it was possible to take something that you were great at and leverage it in a, in a comparative field. So Terrence was a great trumpet player. He came up with uh, the Art Blakey and the Jazz Messengers band, which was like a legendary performance ensemble in, in jazz. Um, he was a recording artist in the jazz field, but uh, you know, he didn't, for instance, get a film scoring degree, right? There's, you know, if he didn't make a traditional route into the film scoring community. Um, and he didn't need to because he was so excellent in his field that, and he developed a reputation that allowed him to make that transition because he was legitimized in, in a comparative field, essentially. Um, so essentially that gave me the impetus, the inspiration, uh, the courage, I think in a certain respect to begin looking at how I could develop uh, in two different disciplines, education and composition. Um, and I hadn't really decided like as a composer, what my you know, field or what, what exact route I wanted to pursue, but I knew I wanted to write music for the first time. And I knew that at a certain point in my life, I wanted to be an educator. Okay, <clears throat> so, First thing that I want to pass on to you um, as, as I kind of talk through this bio is that you are your own business. So regardless of your field, as I said at the outset, right, you live in a time where you're your own cottage business and brand. Through engagement with your friends, your family, colleagues, and the digital lives that we curate, you're telling a story about yourself that informs and supports your business and brand. Okay. And so Right at the outset, um, I ended up moving to New Orleans after meeting Terrence, and he encouraged me essentially to um, hang around the Thelonious Monk Institute of Jazz, which was this premier performing ensemble, um, really globally. It was an opportunity for essentially um, students who had been identified as the best musicians in the, uh, you know, in the jazz field. Um, to get together and play and study in a really like concentrated environment. And Terrence uh, told me essentially, hey man, hang around the program and um, I'll try and you know get you set up in New Orleans if you wanna come down. I did, I took him up on that. Moved down to New Orleans um, in my senior, what would have been my senior year of college. And I started taking classes with Dr. Rosado at the time at Loyola University of New Orleans. And Terrence introduced me to Delphio Marsalis, started playing uh, with the Uptown, Uptown Jazz Orchestra, Delphio's group. I uh, got a chance to meet Ellis Marsalis and, and study with him. Um, I got a chance to play with some of the best musicians uh, of our time in New Orleans. And um, it was a really amazing opportunity number one, as a performer, but number two, it became this test ground for me as a composer. I ended up getting a, um, a twice weekly gig at the House of Blues in New Orleans, and it was a chance to test my own music, 
learn from my mistakes because you know I got to bring something in on a Tuesday, see it fall on its face and bring it in on a Thursday <laughs> revised. Um, I also got to open up while I was there for the Dirty Dozen, which was this, you know, super high level brass band in town. If you guys don't know of them, uh, check them out, Dirty Dozen. And um, like I said, I got a chance to work with with Terrence and uh, the students in the, the Thelonious Monk Institute and really begin to expand my conception of myself as a saxophonist and a composer. Um, essentially, at a certain point, I started to realize that I wanted to do this education piece as well, uh, that I wanted to be a teacher, um, and that some of the most influential people in my life up to that point, uh, Richie Cole, Terrence Blanchard, uh, Aaron Drake, and uh, John Durth, um, who was my like main teacher, and mentor uh, in the Virginia DC area. Uh, these were all people who were, who were active teachers, not just performers. And um, essentially I wanted to, to model myself after them um, in, as, a, as a teacher who also could back it up with performance. Um, and so I kind of realized that to do that, I needed more education. Um, and so um, I ended up going to uh, Rutgers University, uh, doing two master's degrees um, under Ralph Bowen and Lewis Porter. Um, essentially, at the end of my, my master's program, I, talk, I asked uh, Ralph Bowen, who is this extraordinary uh, saxophonist in his own right, I asked him, hey, you know, what, like, what do you think is the next step for me? And he told me, get your PhD, get your terminal education. And uh, so I ended up studying at University of Pittsburgh and got my PhD in music back in, uh, wow, now 2018, if you can believe that. Doesn't feel like that long ago, but time flies. Um, but um, essentially, uh, what I'm kind of building out for you um, is my bio in a certain respect, but I think in a like more important sense refers to essentially an opportunity decision tree is what I'm going to refer to it. So by opportunity decision tree, I think this is something that we can all do again, regardless of field. What I want you guys to think about is what we're often taught, especially in a in a college setting is how to be an expert in, in your field. But oftentimes we're, we're not experts in knowing what opportunities are available to you in your field. So for instance, I mean, I, I'm the visiting director of jazz at University of Utah and our curriculum consists of, for instance, composition classes, arranging classes, uh, performance classes like jazz ensemble and, and uh, small chamber ensembles and improvisation, for instance, right? In a jazz context, we really stress and make aesthetic values based on people's ability to improvise. But that pedagogy, especially when I arrived at University of Utah, had nothing to do with how to build a career as a musician, for example, right? Like what are the opportunities um, available to you. Um, so for instance, I started laying this out for myself, you know, as a composer, what opportunities are available. And for instance, right off the bat, we're talking about commercial and film opportunities. So for instance, jingles for commercials, um, uh, building, building sounds for apps, video games, and uh, other interrelated gaming platforms. Um, film, of course, both short and, and through form or narrative, narrative form film. Um, and then of writing in terms of uh, pop or like commercial music settings, um, you know, those are all interrelated 
uh, fields, right, that coming as a, compos uh, a, a composer, right, like my craft could be applied to any of those interrelated job opportunities, essentially, right? But just because I have the skills doesn't mean that I'm aware necessarily of how to engage with those opportunities, right, essentially to monetize my craft. Um, and then, of course, right, there's also the interrelated question of how do you paint yourself as qualified for those opportunities, right? Um, in terms of performance, right, I set out this decision tree for myself. What are, I have these skills as a saxophonist, but how can I apply them in ways that are going to be commercially viable for me, right? And of course, this is highly dependent, um, at least pre-pandemic on where you lived, right? But in terms of performance opportunities, right? There is the sort of local commercial music scene. And by that, I just sort of generally mean bars, small performance venues that are going to pay you essentially by the set and by, you know, a, a, a certain set agreement of, of hours at that venue uh, for your band. There's also, you know, the um, bands in terms of the, the, the wedding gig scene. Again, I know I'm talking pre-pandemic right now. Um, and then, you know, in a pandemic setting, there's obviously live streaming and sort of by donation or paywall type of uh, virtual performances that are happening where you can monetize strictly your performance practice, right? As a, an educator right now, actually, I think there's sort of this re renaissance going on in terms of edu edutainment or education, education-based entertainment. Um, and so I think across a variety of disciplines, what you're seeing right now is um, essentially paywall, PDF, digital downloads, um, or per, for instance, filtered live streams. So uh, presenting on a, a given topic and then um, asking that uh, people either make a donation or in order to access the handouts or materials that they, they pay for downloads. Um, I think that there's a real opportunity um, across fields to um, essentially live stream or present yourself um, as someone who is representing the discipline, the field, or um, commentating on your area of expertise um, and cultivating a community, a group around, around yourself and um, what, you're, what you're talking about as a, um, in my case, as a performer, as a composer, uh, and as an educator. <laughs> and so I think charting out each pathway and noting the prerequisites you'll need along the way is a really important part of the process to finding out where your niche in the market is, um, which I essentially determine as what you love doing and what you want to be great at. Not what you are great at necessarily, right? But what you're willing to put in and invest in, right? To build your reputation and the perception of yourself as a leader, right? A thought leader in your market. Um, so for me, again, you know, what I laid out for myself is that I play a really challenging music. Um, and by that, what I mean is that for, for many of you who might have listened to my performance, right, you might not have known like exactly what that was all about right? when I started playing. Who is this guy? What is he doing on this, you know, metal tube, right? Um, my market, my niche is to what I think is like a growing sector across a multiplicity of fields, which is essentially the prosumer, the professional consumer in any given niche, okay? I actually first became aware of this this past summer 
when I um, was buying a new road bike. Okay. Um, long story short, a couple of years ago, um, actually the day after defending my dis dissertation, I uh, uh, signed up for my first triathlon and I ran, I, I, I completed a, a sprint triathlon the day after defending my dissertation. Um, I showed up with my mountain bike because that's all I had. I borrowed goggles uh, from a, a woman in another division who had completed the day before me. And um, essentially I had a pair of uh, and one basketball shorts. Essentially, uh, I was completely underprepared for this event, okay? <laughs> Couple years later, uh, and you know, at the height of pande the pandemic this summer, I decided, hey, I'm going to get myself like a real road bike. Am I a pre professional triathlete? Absolutely not. <laughs> okay. However, right, I went online. I did some research. I found some like YouTube channels on triathlons, like and how to prepare for them, and I got really into um, checking out people who are disseminating information on how essentially how to prepare for a, for a triathlon. Okay. And one of the conclusions I drew, uh, from getting into this was, wait a second, like this is a really niche market. And yet here are people, right. Who have built an entire persona, um, and, uh, essentially, a public facing entrepreneurial image of themselves in what, you know, what is, I would think a market that's incredibly small. Right. And so I started realizing I'm doing this all the time as a, as a jazz musician, actually, that there are, um, essentially consumers in music, right. People who are going out and buying, um, for instance, really high level saxophones, mouthpieces, reeds, right? Um, and all of the tech and gear that goes into that. Um, and that's my market, right? My market is creating content, lessons, offering lessons, master classes, my recordings and my digital sheet music, right? Is really for that niche market, right? And yes, I'm going to be able to reach people outside of that niche, right? But my core, right, the base of my support really comes from people who are essentially um, aspirational participants in what I'm doing, right? They're support, like they're supporting me, right? And their hobby is um, is essentially engaging with what I'm doing every day as an artist, right? Every day when I wake up, I'm practicing. I'm writing music, I'm teaching, you know, I'm, I'm teaching what I'm doing on a daily basis to my students, right? The, the main consumers, right, of my work that I'm engaging with are, are people who um, are sharing that lifestyle with me in some way, right? Um, and not just necessarily music, right? There might be other areas that I personally connect with that they connect with too. And if I can build out in those ways, right, then I'm going to not only stimulate my base, but I'm also going to be able to reach out and find new prosumers, right? New people that are in my network, right? They just maybe don't know it yet. And maybe I don't know them yet. Cool. So, my music followed this path too. Um, so I'd love to play you a couple examples of this um, because I think my, my musical evolution is part of this pathway because as my music has grown and shifted and evolved over time, it's allowed me to connect um, in ways that I think really lead up to and prepared me for this opportunity that I had with Disney Pixar. So. What I'd like to play for you is a track from my first album called The Way, which I put out in 2015. Um, to put it in context, this was after I had graduated from my master's program, 
but before I went to uh, my PhD. And so essentially what you're going to hear is like this super hard driving New York jazz sound because that's all I wanted to do at that time, right? Like I just wanted to be part of that scene, part of that community. Um, and so my musical output at the time, right, was an effort to connect with the field, right, that I wanted to join. So let's take a little listen. <clears throat> I'm not gonna play it all, but uh, hope you enjoy it. <laughs> Yes, I did edit that myself in 2013, and it looks like it. <laughs> okay. So, so um, you know, I put this I put this album out there. Um, I I got a really positive response in terms of the critical reception. I did not do as good of a job in terms of marketing the album, like from a financial standpoint. Okay, so in terms of in terms of the critical reception of this project, um, you know, I got some like super positive feedback from major jazz establishments writing about how, uh, you know, well received uh, both the like compositional and the performative aspects of this work were. But uh, for instance, uh, the night that the album was supposed to be released, um, I I had this like huge, like scheduled push on social media scheduled to happen um, and essentially filter all of the, um, the purchasing for the first like two weeks of the project. I wanted to run all of the purchases of the album through my website. Well, um, the scheduled posts all dropped and about two minutes later, uh, a, a bunch of people started contacting me hey, your website isn't working. <laughs> um, essentially, I had uh, collaborated with um, a, a web designer in Pittsburgh um, who um, had a, his server crash. And, um, and so because uh, I wasn't ready, like my pipeline was not like fully established, um, you know, that first couple of days trying to get the website ready, I think like really hurt me on like the, on the financial side of the equation. However, because the album was well received, I was able to leverage the critical reviews I got. And one of the positives from that pop project was that there was a lot of interest overseas, uh, particularly from uh, the Ukraine uh, Hong Kong and China, which I know sounds really random, but in terms of the the digital streaming, like the the metrics that I was able to to analyze, uh, those were like the three hotspots on the map. Um, and interestingly, like for instance, not like the United States. I was you know trying to determine like where should I expend my uh, very limited budget in terms of uh, marketing and promotion and where, uh, where I could find um, the right area to create a tour. So um, 
touring, at least again, pre pandemic, this was, you know, nearly nine years ago now, uh, touring was, and I believe will be again someday, a major revenue stream for performing artists of all kinds. Um, and like I said, uh, Hong Kong and China were, were major hotspots on the map for me. And I, I happen to know several people um, who were a part of the, um, in particular, the, the Chinese music community. <clears throat> so I started reaching out. I actually, I found a promoter uh, to, to help me. Uh, and I booked an entire tour, um, over month long tour for uh, a band to travel to, to China, um, to, to play the music from the album, uh, over a month, uh, worth of concerts, uh, different promotional events, etc. The night before we were supposed to leave on the plane, I'll never forget this. Uh, the promoter contacted me and she told me, Hey, just so you know, before you leave, some of the touring schedule that we put together was aspirational. <laughs> and I was like, what do you mean aspirational? And she said to me, well, the, your current tour schedule is what I wanted to create for you not what we've actually confirmed in terms of the venues and the booking. <laughs> so I asked her, okay, well, uh, how much of the tour is actually set, you know, and the contracts are, are guaranteed when we arrive. And she said, the first performance in Hong Kong is guaranteed. So <laughs> the next 20 concerts essentially had not been confirmed yet um, the night before we left for China. Um, so I messaged my band, uh, mo the, most of the band that you saw on the recording, and I told them, hey guys, listen, I think we need to, you know, I think you guys should probably not follow me, you know, don't get on the, the plane essentially, because we just don't know um, again, I can't guarantee the money that I promised you at the outset. Um, it's, you know, at this point, like might be better to cut your losses and to stay stateside. And because I have amazing friends <laughs> and colleagues, uh, two of them told me, what are you doing? Um, and I told them I'm going to go and essentially see what I can do, like try and see what I can make of, of this opportunity, even in spite of the fact that, you know, I might get there and just like hang out for a month, right. With nothing to do. Um, I'm going to like roll the dice essentially. And two amazing people, um, my drummer, Gustin Rudolph and Peter Park, uh, the guitarist in my band decided we're going, we're going with you. If you're going, we're going. All right. Um, and so thus began one of the longest nights in my life because I ended up staying up um, that night and then through the plane ride to China to try and contact as many universities, uh, different performance venues and um, network virtually uh, through WeChat, which is this sort of Swiss army knife app. If, you, if you've ever coordinated or collaborated with anyone in China, I'm sure you've heard of it. Um, got onto WeChat, started pushing out the fact that we were gonna get there in about 30 hours. <laughs> and uh, to try and hook us up with opportunities when we arrived. Um, I'd love to perf uh, just play you a little uh, segment of what we ended up doing there because I'm really proud of what we ended up putting together, which was essentially reconstructing on the fly the large majority of the tour. We ended up staying for just over a month, like 34 days. While we were there, we played over 20 concerts and um, 
yeah, it, it was just a really like pivotal experience in my life. So we just play a little segment of this tune called Catch and Release, um, which is, oh, the backstory essentially is that we were at a, um, we were, um, we had met the primary wine distributor for China, the nation, uh, because it's a communist government, essentially, um, you know, you have this system where like, you know, bureaucratically speaking, people have these hugely powerful niches. So for instance, right, like we ended up meeting uh, this amazing character named Sam, who was uh, in charge of all distribution of wine um, commercially throughout the nation. So <clears throat> Sam ended up hooking us up with a lot of performing opportunities, including uh, the one that I'm going to play for you right now, which was, um, well, you're about to see. Um, it was outside <laughs> at this place called the Jazz Garden. Um, to put it in context, uh, it was 100% humidity and about 99 degrees outside <laughs> when we did this. So it was pretty wild. Um, but I think it's like a great example of like what we were able to put together on the fly. So this is a tune that I wrote actually on the tour called Catch and Release. <laughs> Ultimately, one of the things that I thought was going to be a weakness about this band, right? There's no bassist, there's no pianist, right? Like there's like critical elements of, of the band missing from, from the group that we ended up taking on this tour, right? Um, but instead of that being a weakness, right? We ended up working around it and, and turning it into a really unique like musical product. Um, so, I mean, like what you're hearing, I think from like this particular trio, right? From my perspective is three people who are all figuring out ways to be the bassist that's not there, right? So like in a musical context, the bassist is usually like one of the most important, if not the most important musical element of any group, right? Um, because right they're laying the foundation right that is the bottom support structure upon which everything the drums the voice other instruments are being are, are being layered on top of right so 
We don't have that here, right? But um, essentially, all three of us are communicating that ghost base part at different times, right? And because it's not there, we are all developing, right, a skill set that we wouldn't have had otherwise, right? And I think that was one of the major takeaways for me as an artist, but I think for all of you, right, at some point in terms of your, your pursuits, right, in an entrepreneurial context, right, be it business, um, you know, other fields, right, like, there's going to be times where you feel like you have your hand tied behind your back right? That like, I could have done this so much better, right? If I had perhaps this tool, right? Or this connection, or uh, the ability to ask, you know, insert person here for advice or feedback, right? And instead of, right, thinking about the things that you don't have, right? Try and look around, right? To what you do have, right? And then build out, right? Along those lines, build build something for yourself out of what's available rather than focus on what you don't have or what's not available to you. Um, I, th I, th I think about this all the time right now in a COVID context, right? As an educator, right? Especially because um, one of the things that I don't have right now is the opportunity to teach in person in a musical context. And that is huge, right? That is a huge limitation, right? That I, I think about, I, I, I'll admit, I think about this every day. If only I could be in the room with my band right now or with my students, right? I could just show them this or I could literally, you know, touch that key on the piano, right? Or, right, there's so many things that we're lacking in, in this, um, in this uh, sort of Zoom world that we're a part of now. Um, and again, like I said, I think about that all the time. I think about the things that I can't do all the time. Um, but essentially in, um, in the early fall, you know, in, in like mid-September, I started thinking about what are the things that we can do that we might not have been doing, right? in person. And one of the things that I know that pretty much all musicians weren't doing was like recording all the time, right? Like recording your own um, parts, right? Like producing your own music. Um, that was a niche, right? That was an area that like most people pre-pandemic were not really a part of and um, became the only thing that you could possibly do when the pandemic hit. Um, and so what I ended up doing, right, was instead of bemoaning essentially the fact that I couldn't rehearse in person, I decided to go the other direction, right? I went, I leaned into the fact that we have this music, music recording technology available to us and, um, Essentially, you know, in, in the early fall, our jazz ensemble started doing all of these collaborative um, and, and virtual recording projects um, that now I think you'll probably recognize as sort of like one of the main ways that musicians are interacting these days. Um, so, for instance, you know, we put together a recording. Let me show it to you. It sounds like this.
let me fast forward a little bit um, because uh, I'd love to to open it up for questions and you know and get into more of a dialogue with you guys. Um, so let me jump back into my PowerPoint for a second and run down a couple of things for you. Um, first of all, just want to highlight these two points here. Um, nothing is free. That, that's something I'd, I'd love for you to just like write down for yourself right now. Free means filtered, especially in a digital context. Okay. Um, think about it. For instance, everything that you access on social media, be it TikTok, Instagram, Facebook, uh, Linktree, et cetera, is free, right? Those tools are free but they're filtered, right? You give up things, right? Like your time, like your email address, your phone number, right? And th that data, right? That input that you, that you willingly give, right? For quote unquote free access, right? That's used to monetize, right? Your participation, right? Um, that happens on, you know, on essentially like a big, a big data, um, a big, uh, like corporate level, right? But you can do this at your own level uh, as well, right? You can create your own filters, for instance, right? Hey, check out this new track if you sign up for my mailing list, right? Hey, here's a free download, right? If you uh, click on this link, right, that takes you to my website where I have, um, you know, merch for sale, right? Or perhaps you can like network with another brand, right? That will willingly uh, provide you with maybe a piece of um, like a new product that they're advertising, right? And you can have a sort of like contest collaboration process, right? Um, when we think of things as free, right? We tend to think of them um, as stuff that we just have to give to people right without some sort of trade right or exchange happening but whether we recognize it or not that exchange is uh that exchange is underway right and by recognizing it we can start to use it to our advantage right um the next thing that i want to talk about is that sharing your current process is advertising future product sharing current process is advertising future product. And what I mean by this is um, essentially um, something that I've come to learn in terms of my own compositional um, development, right? Is that rather than try and hold something back until it's fully formed, right? Okay, now I'm going to share like the final recording, right? Of my composition. Instead, what I'll do now, right, um, is that I will stage out pieces of the process, maybe a musical motive, maybe a, a little snippet of the score, you know, a, a, a image of the score, or a brief little segment of the recording. Um, and I will try and use social media as a way of staging or working up to the final product is the final product done in this model? No, it's not, right? Like I'm literally inviting my community into the creative process. And it also allows me the opportunity to essentially like uh, create a focus group, right? Like the people that I am trying to buy in to my product, right? Literally get to weigh in on how it's shaped. Um, and again, something that I'm talking about in a musical setting, right? But I think you could very easily use this model, right? In terms of whatever it is that you want to share with the world and perhaps, you know, at the, your, your end goal to get them to want to buy it, right? To want to engage with that product. <clears throat> Next aspect that I want to talk about is holistic social media. Okay. Something that I think we've probably all done, right? There's a temptation to essentially like either buy a piece of software or um, to use like a free platform um, to essentially take one post, right? Like one piece of content 
and blast it out across like every possible platform, right? Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, Linktree, et cetera. You know, I'll take one post and that'll go out onto, you know, six different platforms, right? However, these platforms are not created equal, right? You have different followers on different platforms based on the platform strength and weakness. And um, essentially what you want to have happen is this tip of the iceberg effect where, for instance, if I find your YouTube page uh, because I'm a fan of listening to full length concerts, for example, right? And then I click a link at the bottom of the YouTube page, right? And follow this to your, uh, to your website and all of those same videos, right, are on there and nothing else, right? Or for instance, uh, I'm on Instagram and I'm listening to some like 60 second, you know, clips of, um, of your music, right? But then I can't go and listen to a full length concert. Um, or maybe your website has everything and then like Instagram is literally just the same broadcast. Um, you're going to lose people, right? Um, and so what I've tried to do is delineate for myself, right? Like essentially like, like a, a, a media conglomerate would do, right? Decide what platform is going to provide a specific function that you try not to deviate from at all, right? So for me, it's very simple. I just try and think of like a one word summation of what the platform is for me. Facebook billboards, Instagram, culture, website, CV, Linktree, best of. Okay. Let me just give you a quick example. So this is my Linktree page. And I'm constantly changing it because for me, I'm always updating my activity, right? Like my, you know, my projects, what is currently on my plate changes, right? Almost every month, right? So for instance, at the top of my Linktree page is stuff about soul, um, in particular, because I knew I was presenting to you today, right? So I knew that I was gonna wanna talk about this, right? So the first thing that comes up is a review of uh, soul and discussing my collaboration. Um, some clips from my performance in the studio, um, a talkback uh, video with Jake Saslow, a fellow tenor saxophonist. Um, and then, oh, here, get presence on Bandcamp, right? Hey, like for people who are, you know, super interested in what I'm doing, right? Hey, you can buy the digital album and all of my music for 20 bucks. And this is constantly changing, right? Every month I'll go in and I'll have a different sort of best of list, right? Um, you know, for instance, for my, my Instagram page, I think of it more from like a cultural perspective. I'm putting out um, uh, watches. I'm a huge like luxury watch fanatic, wine, coffee, my Australian shepherd, right? Like all kind of factors into my Instagram, like culture that I'm like curating. Um, whereas on Facebook, right, for instance, you'll see like the billboard for this talk. Um, and I try and like keep that into their separate lanes as much as possible so that someone hopefully like you, right. Or, um, someone that I'm trying to reach can sort of weave through these different platforms and find different information about me and maybe connect with one platform over another or a set of platforms instead of another. Cool. All right. Next thing I want to talk to you about, and this is especially, I think, as you grow your platform, um, your, uh, you gain notoriety within your community. Um, and you can start investing with, in yourself more. Um, and so regardless of your chosen like discipline, getting high quality professional photography on a regular basis, not just like once now, and then you use like a press kit photo 
for the next, you know, 15 years, right? But essentially, um, constantly um, engaging in um, and having access to professional photography of you and your products is super important. Either de uh, number two, either developing the skill set yourself or coordinating with excellent graphic designers um, who can provide artwork um, and engaging imagery for your business. Number three, I tried to learn the skill set myself, but now <laughs> I collaborate with videographers um, who do professional quality editing for me um, so that my product, right, continually evolves and is at, you know, the highest level in terms of quality of presentation possible. And um, for me specifically, but I think in, you know, at, at any point in the lifespan of a business, it's important to, to align yourself with a publicist um, who can essentially reach out um, across particularly old media, legacy media, uh, to make yourself and your platform, um, your business um, or yourself, as the case might be, as visible as possible. Um, essentially, publicists are doing uh, what we do every day, right? They're building their network, their connections, and uh, their ability to place their clients into high visibility professional situations. Um, so, I mean, we can only go so far, right, before we need to sort of jump a tier and publicists allow us to do that regardless of field. Next thing I want to talk to you about is the John Petroselli paradox, okay, <laughs> which sounds kind of odd, okay, but I think as soon as I show you, you'll see what I'm talking about. There is another John Petroselli. There's a lot of John Petroselli's, but in particular is a John Petroselli who was born almost the same year as me and is in a really high visibility field um, like what I'm doing as a musician. But uh, let me show you. This John Petroselli is a basketball player, <laughs> okay? So in terms of people finding me on social media um, or uh, trying to find information about me, right? Especially with just like a basic Google search, John Petroselli, the basketball player, uh, because he's uh, in the, the NBA, um, essentially the, the D League right now, I think he's made, he's, he's taken a, another step up. I think he's going to make it to the show pretty soon, guys. John Petroselli beats me out in terms of SEO, search engine optimization, every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Okay. I just cannot compete with this cat. But John Petroselli sacks wins every time. Okay. John Petroselli Jazz wins every time, okay? Even though John Petroselli, the basketball player, played for like a Utah Jazz, like D-League team even, okay? <laughs> so here's the thing, right? You don't want to try and swim upstream in terms of getting yourself out there in a digital marketing environment, right? There are just going to be bigger fish in the sea that push down your search engine optimization results. And your goal should be for people to be able to find you organically at all times, right? Um, so let's say like someone listens to, um, let, let's see, let's say my name shows up in the credits of Soul, for instance, right? Um, and someone wants to find me to engage with me um, in a future collaboration. Well, um, if they type in like John Petroselli music, John Petroselli jazz, saxophone, et cetera, right? My name is going to come up because I've used an SEO uh, company to essentially keep my uh, search results high, right? But at the same time, I'm not even trying to like push down John Petroselli, the basketball player's Wikipedia page, for example, right? I've created a niche, right? And I'm building my presence in that niche rather than trying to like stay too broad, right? which is a, an area, right, that I can't compete with right now. 
not until you know John Petroselli decides to like become a coach or something. <laughs> All right, makes sense. <clears throat> so what I'd encourage you to do right now even is to search yourself on Google. What will people find? And especially as you try and build toward um, like a business or your own personal brand, right? You can use SEO tools to help drive eyes toward the content that you want and away from the content you cannot change, okay? This is your digital footprint. And consistency should be your first priority. Create handle names across your platforms that are easy to identify as the same, right? Um, this is a, a situation that like I run into constantly with uh, former students. I'll go onto their Instagram page and it's, you know, bballboy42, right? And then if you go over to their Facebook fan page, it's, you know, Jeremy Jazz, right? And there's no way that someone, for instance, who's following you on Facebook can find you on Instagram or, in, you know, if they're following you on Instagram to find you on Twitter, right? And so you want people to be able to find you organically without having to um, like <laughs> contact you first, for example. Um, next and last thing in terms of maintaining a digital footprint is to build out a clear, concise website and maintain it. This is a, a, a trap that I fell into early on in my career, where like my website essentially was an archive of all of my recordings, all of my old like compositions, um, photography, right? It just became like overwhelming, I think, to a viewer, an, or, an organic user uh, who was interested in engaging with my work. Um, what you wanna do is I think strive for minimalism as, little information as you as possible, right? But then keep it current, right? Make sure that it's being updated uh, at least a couple times a month, I would say. And um, make sure that um, essentially it becomes something where if you don't check it, right? Like you could miss something, right? Like you want people feeling like, hey, let me, you know, let me make this a part of my habit or routine. Uh, because then you're building engagement and engagement builds community and community builds consumers. Okay. Two more slides and then we'll have a little bit of a talk back session. First of all, uh, what are revenue streams, right? And how do we build them? Revenue streams are sources from which your business will earn money, okay? And uh, to me, there's three ways of evaluating and creating a revenue stream for yourself. So number one is source. And by source, what I mean is who is the person, right, creating the transaction with you? Um, so let's take an example. A few years ago now, I wrote a book. Um, and uh, it was a book of musical transcriptions, essentially solos of a particular saxophonist, uh, Warren Marsh. And so my source in this case, the person that I'm, I was expecting to buy this book, right, are student saxophonists, right? People who are um, perhaps um, evolving their craft, right? Like students of the music, um, or even professional musicians with like a, a really uh, high level of interest in this particular saxophonist, right? Um, I decided to create this book because it's in alignment with who I am as a composer, saxophonist, and educator, right? So I'm offering a product that makes sense for my branding and my marketing, uh, my platform, my business as an artist, right? And the method, uh, was essentially a digital download. So something that you can access and purchase through my website. Um, also something that I was able to sell to university library systems that wanted uh, to include it in their archive of jazz holdings. Um, so these three um, criteria, I think, really have to be met anytime you want to establish 
a revenue stream or a new revenue stream, right? You consider your source, alignment with your current business model, and the method in which uh, you're expecting your source to engage with the product. I realize I haven't actually talked about Soul yet, <laughs> but, uh, but I, this is the kind of the, the conclusion of the uh, sort of like digital marketing and uh, the, the segment of how I sort of built my career up to the point of, of Soul. So I th think that maybe this is a good point to pause for a few minutes and, and maybe, you know, hear from you. Uh, are there questions at this point? Um, is there uh, perhaps a way in which I can help you apply some of this model to your own work? Um, or are there just comments in general at this point? Feel free to either use the chat function or to, um, you know, maybe unmute and, and jump in. Water's warm. So while the students get their thoughts together and, and, and write their, their questions in the chat or wherever they want to do, I just thought your story is perfect, right? It fits so well into, and not that you think it's perfect probably, but it fits to what we think entrepreneurs are and, and sort of how they go about, right? It doesn't matter the discipline, it doesn't matter the field that you sort of navigate that you touched in every single point that you could as an entrepreneur, right? And all while sort of fostering your skill, your 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 art, right? And not, so this is why we do these, these talks that are like, what does he have to do with entrepreneurship? But it's everything because you talked about marketability, storytelling, monetizing your skill, right? That target market, your niche, identifying who they are, providing them with, what they didn't know they needed right right Their music and what you know that kind of stuff they sometimes people don't know they need that um and it's very soothing so that's amazing you know know who your audience is because that leads straight to how will you make money right like that source that you end up talking about that alignment that method of how they're going to pay you and all that stuff. So I'm like, that was my note taking I don't know what you you know the students were taking notes but I think it's very inspirational, um, but it's also extremely thoughtful in terms of the process. And I know sometimes we as entrepreneurs go back and think about sort of the process, not necessarily while we're doing it, but it also talks a lot about your resilience. I mean, like that trip to China, not knowing, <laughs> converted, you know, a lot of challenges into opportunities. Again, that's stickler of what an entrepreneur could do. And sort of, I put it out there to all the students who are artists in any shape, way or form, how could you leverage something like entrepreneurship and build new skills to really put your story out there? So hopefully you guys have amazing questions. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, uh, Dean, thanks so much. What's yeah. up, man? So when you guys went on tour uh, in China, just the three of you, and yeah. only that first show was, uh, actually going to happen did you guys keep on playing or what exactly happened with the rest of the shows yeah so um essentially what happened was um there was a set of there was a set of venues that my promoter had um either wanted to contact but didn't <laughs> or did contact but didn't actually confirm like contractually that we were going to perform so um, you know, this is actually like a great lesson in of itself, right? Which is that if you don't have it in writing, guys, it's not real, like from a business perspective, right? Like, I'm going to say that one more time. If you don't have it in writing, it's not real in terms of a business, right? In terms of something that you can count on to have to have happen. Um, and frankly, in like an international context, right? Like when you're leaving the United States, sometimes even it's hard to enforce a contract in writing because for instance, I'll just be honest, I don't speak Chinese, right? <laughs> like we, we, and we toured with like our promoter who was also our translator. And, you know, thank God we did because uh, frankly, there were several situations that we got into along the way that month that couldn't have been overcome with the language barrier involved, right? 
So like you want to make sure that you have, again, like that you have things in writing um, and agreed upon as clearly as possible, because if you don't, um, you know, you're going to have a lot of heartache, uh, you know, mo like more times than not, like, you know, I'm telling you the story of something that happened, right, that was successful, right? There's a, <laughs> there's a lot of instances I could give you where, you know, things didn't work out as rosy, you know what I mean? Um, yeah. It, anyway, so like I said, I mean, what, what ended up happening, uh, two, two major things ended up happening. Um, I connected with a band that was based in Hong Kong um, that was, at the time, was extremely well known. They had a, a high degree of visibility um, in mainland China. And so um, I cut a deal with them um, on social media, on this platform, WeChat. Hey, if you guys open for us, right, at your venues, right, like we essentially did like a, a split, like in terms of the performance fee, where um, using their connections to um, like their regular venues, we put, I, I put together like a third of the tour, just asking them to open for us. So in other words, like they already had like network, a network of contacts with, uh, I think it was like close to 10 venues through, through this, the, the mainland of China. And so um, I piggybacked on top of like their connections. And um, so essentially I put a third of the tour together just by connecting with this one group and, you know, teaming up essentially. So that was a third, of, like about 10, 10 of the performances. Um, the next like third of the tour, essentially I put together by going back to the, uh, the venues that hadn't confirmed yet, essentially, you know, making sure that the contracts were solid. As, again, like that, a big part of the problem was that there was a language barrier. So my contracts that I sent to the promoter were in, in English. A lot of the venues there weren't comfortable signing an English language contract, right? So like there was a translation, a literal translation that had to take place before they were willing to sign on. Um, but essentially by the time I landed, two thirds of the tour had been put back together, okay? And the last third, I'm gonna try and tell this in a way that I'm gonna be, I'm comfortable with, with a recording being made of this. Um, the, uh, <laughs> the person that I mentioned, Sam, um, who, uh, who ran like the wine distribution for China at the time, he was, um, he was like a, a partier, <laughs> but essentially we met him because he came to our first gig and like just dug the music. And so he invited us onto, um, this like mega yacht that he had at the time. And um, we ended up like having like a like pretty wild for, for us, it was daytime, but it was night there in Hong Kong by the time we landed. Right. Um, because it's a 12 hour time difference. Essentially, Sam had a ton of contacts because he you know, sold liquor across the country. Um, he had a ton of connections with like vineyards, different like, you know, like major bars and um, and like venues that served alcohol in China. Um, and he essentially, he came along with us um, on the tour. Um, and so uh, the other like third of the performance opportunities came through Sam. Yeah. Great question. Thanks. Yeah, thank you. That's awesome. Thanks, man. Other questions that I can... Uh, help you guys out with? I have a question if I may. Yeah. Um, this this is more, I guess, geared towards the uh, entrepreneurship aspect of your career. How did you keep yourself motivated when things like didn't go the way you planned? For example, like the story you talked about in China, how did you, you know, keep that drive in you to be like, man, I'm gonna just do it, you know, like if it flops or not? Because I know a lot of people wouldn't take that risk feeling that like, oh, man, like, does the pros outweigh the cons or, or vice versa? Absolutely. I mean, man, that's, 
That's an amazing question. I mean, that's the heart, that, right? That's the heart of what we do, right? I mean, entrepreneurship wouldn't be called entrepreneurship if it was a sure thing, <laughs> right? So we're all risk takers here. Um, and I think that there's always going to be times where it seems like the deck is stacked against us or that the deck, the deck is actually stacked against us. <laughs> I, I mean, I would argue that like, every musician has felt that at some point and i'm and i'm sure in in other you know fields right where like you have to kind of like take that leap of faith right um that there are times where where you can feel like should i right should i even keep trying and that's it's a highly personal question at the same time i think that the, the simple answer, right, is that hmm. I think the simple answer is that for you, like, I think it goes back to what, like, what something I said at the beginning of my talk, right? Like, it's about finding something that you want to be great at not something that you know will sell great, right? Or something that you, you know, necessarily know will work, right? It's not even necessarily about the product itself, right? It's about developing yourself, right? As a person and sort of as a brand in your sphere in ways that no matter what happens, right? Like you want um, that, like essentially I think that, um, that outward facing like persona that like, I think we all, you know, cultivate for ourselves in one way or another, right. That becomes so important to, I think like your, your identity, um, that it, it doesn't matter what happens, right. Like that you're just going to keep going no matter what. Um, and I think that's number one. Number two is that it's always easy to, to draw a straight line in reverse, right? Like I'm putting together a very linear presentation for you this evening, right? I can assure you that it didn't feel linear at the time, right? Like sometimes you you succeed, right? Or sometimes you like you have something that you think will work, right? And then, right for whatever reason, like you have like a gigantic setback, right? Um, and though like that push and pull i think the longer you stick with it that push and pull becomes right like the actual um that becomes like more and more comfortable because you know that like when you experience setbacks it's you know it's just like essentially like the wave uh, like the wave effect right like there's high tide and low tide right like there's going to be times where it feels like like that water is just like crashing right on top of you. But then like all of a sudden, right, the water pulls back. Right. And essentially, right, like we're all just trying to float. Right. Like those waves are happening regardless. Right. But as long as you kind of like surf, right, like you stay on top of, uh, you know, and just float with the water. Right. I mean, go, you know, like I said, don't try and fight the current, just try and like find like your own stream, essentially. I think a great example of this actually is the recording that I didn't play for you tonight. So if you check out um, Apple Music and you go on, or, you know, whatever, the streaming platform of your choice, and you check out this band called Mischievous Minx, which I co-led back in, Wow, 2017 now, okay? We put out this EP, and I'm not gonna lie, at the time, I thought that this was gonna be like the next, like, you know what I mean? Like the next snarky puppy, like the next, you know what I mean? Big, big thing in like, like this sort of like R&B, like funk, soul, jazz scene. I thought that this was gonna be awesome. And for a variety of reasons, it just wasn't, okay? <laughs> But I was crushed at the time. Like we put out this record and I was like, man, the tunes, right? Like our vocalist, the band, like how could this not work? And it just didn't, right? And 
part of it was that it was the right project at like the absolute wrong time to be perfectly honest for me because i under i like i undertook this project knowing that i didn't have the money together to really promote it okay so like i wanted to do it so bad i tried to force something right that i just wasn't ready to try and like get behind the way I knew I would need to, to make it successful. Let me just play a little bit just because this still hurts a little bit, <laughs> honestly. Uh, let's see. that was going to be so hot just like I thought that was like the thing and um and maybe it could have been right but everything I just laid out to you tonight shows you why that didn't work right at what point in this talk did I talk about r and soul soul music right like funk so there was no preparation, right? Like there was no development that led me up to releasing that project, right? And so when it came out, a lot of people were like, I didn't know that you did that, right? Like, I mean, you know what I mean? It just didn't resonate, right? And I hadn't developed the network, right? That I needed to connect with that audience, right? The audience that consumes that music, right? So I, you know, I, I, I knew that like on some level, right? But I just, I wanted it so bad, right? Like in that moment that I wasn't patient enough, right? To kind of like develop the, like the, the foundation that I needed to be able to get the project to, you know, where it needed to go, if that makes sense. So um, I guess to conclude, you know, I think there, you know, there's a season you know, for your work, right? I mean, and, and I think, like, yeah, you're always going to experience setbacks, sometimes in really, really painful ways, right? But if you if like, what you're doing is at the core, right, of like your identity, right? Like, I can't, I can't imagine a John Petroselli, right? Not the basketball player, me. <laughs> I can't imagine a John Petroselli that's not a musician broadly construed in some way, right? Like at the end of the day, the horn is going to be a part of who I am in some way, right? Um, if that's you, right, in what you do, then you're going to, you're going to get there essentially, right? Like, uh, you know what I mean? It might take you longer than you wanted. It might not look exactly the way that you thought it was going to look when you set out on that decision tree. But I do think that like, there is a niche for everyone and you can define it and create it for yourself and, um, and, and be successful in that environment. If you're patient enough and flexible enough and determined enough. Thanks for your question, Nicholas. Any other areas or things that we can chat about together, guys? Those are great questions. Yeah, I have a question. Yeah, Salvatore. Um, do you play any other instruments? Um, yes, there's 
if I could show you without ruining everything, I, <laughs> I would show you around the room. Um, I have a drum kit here. I have a Fender Rhodes. It's an electric piano from the, the 1970s. Um, I've got a, a bass clarinet here. I've got, well, I've got the, you know, heard me play the alto, soprano saxophone. I've got a, a tenor saxophone here. Um, I play flute and clarinet. Um, I play an Indian two drum instrument called the tabla. And, um, oh, I, I've been, uh, I've been studying electric bass through the pandemic just as like a, a new area. I've actually never learned a string instrument before, uh, before I started electric bass. And it was just, uh, it was like a we a weakness, like, like that I just wanted to try and like resolve, right? Like, honestly, I've never understood string instruments before, <laughs> like the mechanics of them are as different from saxophone playing as you could possibly imagine. I mean, uh, I mean, essentially like, um, yeah, they're just hugely like different on like a technical level. Um, and so I've always kind of shied away from them, honestly. Uh, but yeah, I've been trying to rectify, like, you know, cover up, cover up that deficiency a little bit over the pandemic. Do you play Salvatore? Yeah, I play a uh, guitar, bass, uh, a little bit of drums, and I played clarinet in high school. Oh, awesome, man. You know, that's one of the cool things about the pandemic is, you know, especially if, you know, if you're like learning like more than one instrument, you can do multi-track recording and put together like your own like collaborations. Pretty cool, actually. Um, and it's a good, I think it's like a good uh, just like test of like your own playing. So yeah. Was there anything else you wanted to ask or uh, did I answer your question? You're good. Thank you. You're welcome. All right, guys. Anything else that's come to mind? Okay. In that case, I think maybe I'll talk to you a little bit about soul, <laughs> if that's okay. Um, so um, let me pull up the, the slideshow and we'll, we'll jump into this. <clears throat> okay. Oh, you know what? I did want to talk to you guys about this a little bit, but maybe I'll come back to that at the end. Okay, so soul, let's talk about it. So essentially I get an email on December 18th, um, a representative from Disney Pixar uh, reached out to me and um, laid it all out in his email. Um, Nick Tarnowski with Allied Media has, you know, has been like a really wonderful point of contact with, with the company. Um, and his goal was, John, um, we saw your uh, live stream concert. I did a, uh, a live stream concert of the music of Dave Brubeck um, back in November. And um, I timed it, speaking of plateauing, I timed it with uh, Dave Brubeck's centennial, his 100th birthday. So there's a lot of eyes on, on um, Dave Brubeck and, and those albums, uh, specifically uh, Time Out. Um, the Blue Note album. It, if you haven't, um, if you don't know, know who I'm talking about, you've definitely heard either Blue Rondo a la Turk or Take Five, um, which are some like really classic compositions associated with Dave. Um, and I don't mean Dave Matthews. <laughs> anyway, um, I did this concert. Uh, it was live streamed. It went viral. It reached uh, well over 70,000 people. And um, one of them was Nick. And so he checked out my recording of Presence, um, which was um, one of my, which is my latest album. Let me just play a little snippet of it so you can get an idea. Essentially, um, my music started moving more toward, I would say like film score, like mood, mood music, um, like definitely complex artistic mood music, but, <laughs> Definitely, um, I think something that began to like, I think, attract a, a wider audience outside of the jazz genre. 
Um, and so let me just play what I'm talking about so you can get an idea. Nick found this piece. Um, and so he connected with the live stream, but then heard this piece and this tune, this composition is what inspired him to like choose me essentially. just answer the next question on everyone's mind. Yes, the man bun was a mistake for me. No, I could not pull it off. And yes, I do recognize that. <laughs> okay. Um, however, actually, uh, one quick thing that you should know is that like everything that you saw in that video was like sponsored or underwritten. So like I had endorsement deals with like my mouth, my mouthpiece maker, uh, the reed on my on my mouthpiece, um, my neck strap. Um, we collaborated with uh, AKG microphones, so all the microphones were uh, sponsored, um, and I got a um, endorsement deal with. Um, I'm sorry, and not endorsement. I, I the the recording project itself was underwritten by the National Endowment for the Arts. Uh, I was I got a grant through um, the foundation. And um, so there was essentially a number of different levels of uh, sponsorship and support that made that recording possible. Nicholas, yeah, you have a question? Yeah. Um, how'd you go about obtaining those uh, sponsorships? Because I know like, let's, totally. I'm, or, well, rather, yeah, I'll just leave it to you. Yeah, but, no, I mean, it's a great question, right? Um, and essentially, it, it goes back to something that um, I forget. Someone asked that really great question about like staying with it, like sticking, you know what I mean? Like how, you know, where does that like come from, right? And essentially like over time, right? Like we grow, per uh, we, we, we grow perpendicular with other people and businesses, right? Like, we're always on a same path, like a similar path with someone, another business, another group of people, right? Like, even if we're, we don't necessarily know them or recognize what they're doing, like at certain points, you know what I mean? Your head will pop up and you'll be like, oh, like someone shares, right? This vision with me, right? Um, and for me, uh, like for instance, with um, my like reads, so um, back in like 20, I don't know, 2012, maybe, um, I found these reads, they're called Ishimori's. It's a Japanese um, 
uh, read uh, company that I found these reads, I put one on and like just immediately it was like, this is, you know what I mean? Like th this is what I sound like, you know what I mean? It just resonated with where I was like musically and as an artist, like, and um, the combination, right? The combination of like what I was already doing alongside of this product, right? Um, made me better, right? And anytime, um, uh, and, and and it started by purchasing them, right? Like I, you know, I, I was a consumer of that product first, right? Um, but over time, right, as my career, um, in, you know, expanded, and you know, frankly, like my notoriety increased, right? Like I got a publicist, right? Got press, went on several tours, and then Ishimori was like, "Hey, could you know what I mean? Could we help you here?" Right. So. Um, a more recent example is actually with uh, Grand Seiko. So um, I'm wearing this watch. Um, I got it uh, back in January. Um, and essentially, um, I, I've collaborated on a series of performance videos wearing this watch with the Grand Seiko brand, and it's going to come out this summer. Um, and essentially, I love, I love watches. Um, I already owned a Grand Seiko. Um, the brand saw what I was doing um, and, and, you know, frankly, I tagged them in a whole bunch of stuff for like over a year. And then they reached out to me in January um, and, you know, I, there will be some um, videos of, of my work wearing this watch um, that's going to be cross promoted. Um, Essentially, they're like they were looking for like young, like art, artist, you know, artistic types in the United States to try and like help promote their own brands. And, you know, again, that alignment. Right. I'm in alignment with what their vision is. Right. Um, and like they're trying to market to people like me. Right. And so as a representative, I'm I'm aiding. I'm I'm helping them. Right. In some way as well. Um you know, the moment that you can be of service to another brand, right, is the moment that like those endorsements and like sponsorships will start to happen. And not a moment before. Because <laughs> right? like, I, I can tell you, like, I mean, I had reached out to like different brands for years, some of which, like, I just like they were a big brand, right? I didn't own any of their stuff, right? Like, and sometimes I would never hear back, right? Because like, it's really obvious like from the outside looking in like, oh, like is John someone who uses our product is someone who like we want to engage, right? Like that business is looking at you as a potential collaborator too, right? And the moment that it becomes something that aids both, right? Parties is the moment that like those sorts of collaborations will begin to happen. Does that answer your question? Yes, thank you. Cool. All right. Um, totally. Well, what I can do, guys, um, if if you'll indulge me, is uh, why don't I play you a clip from from the composition that I wrote? Um, some of the like source material I was provided to like help help guide my compositional process, and then I'll kind of like put a wrap on it, and maybe we can you know take some more questions or have a little more free form talk back session. So if you'll indulge me, I think I can do that in like 10 minutes, give or take. What do you guys think? Okay, I'm gonna jump in. <laughs> I'm gonna jump in. Okay, so like I said, Nick found that recording, wanted me um, to, wanted to commission me to write something for Soul. But I had a really short time frame. <laughs> so the deadline was December 23rd. So essentially, I had five days to write the music, to record the music, and to submit the final product back to Disney for use promoting the movie. Because if you guys were, you know, uh, saw the movie, right, it came out um, on Christmas, uh, on Christmas Eve. So um, like they needed it like, um, <laughs> like almost immediately. So 
I got three clips. Um, I'll play one of them right now um, just to give you an idea of like this, what I, you know, they, they wanted, they gave me three little snippets to try and um, just give me an idea of like the spirit, the vibe, right? The general atmosphere of the movie. And my job was to turn around a composition that sort of reflected again, like the, the overall spirit uh, or attitude uh, of the film. My name is John Baptiste and it's a pleasure to be here to celebrate soul. Pixar is incredible and it's been a pleasure to work on this music. And I'm gonna play something that, this is the first time I'm ever playing it publicly and you're the first people to hear it. This is entitled Born to Play. As everybody's born to do something like all of you, I believe Joe, our main character in the film was born to play. And this song represents that. Here we go. stop Jonathan Batiste. Okay. Don't tell him that I did that because <laughs> he's awesome. Um, but okay. That was, that was the main, the main musical influence that I was given. And then I also got this trailer, which is now, um, which you can also find on YouTube. So I'm going to show it to you here, um, about essentially the neighborhood, uh, like this idea of like community that under underlines the movie. This movie, Soul, celebrates the idea of community and the people that are around us. It shines a beautiful artistic light on what a uh, neighborhood and love for your neighbor should be. Joe's neighborhood formed him in the way a lot of city kids grow up, where it's not just your immediate family that kind of raise you. You're brought up by everybody that you come in contact with in your neighborhood. Joe's still stopping by his mother's tailoring shop, and all the women that work there are like aunties and surrogate mothers to him. You look mom. It fits perfect. There's the barber shop and all the locals who are there week to week to week. You can go into that barber shop and you can talk about anything from love, laughter, anger, politics, and feel comfortable. And it's a good old fashioned neighborhood where everybody knows your name. Okay. And there was one other clip, but for the sake of time, I got three. I got three little snippets about about like three and a half, four minutes worth of like material um so not much like i i mean i didn't get like a full cut of the movie for example so i had no idea like what it was you know what i mean in terms of continuity um what the what the like whole movie was about until i i watched it with all of you actually um when it came out so um what i needed to do um, was sort of segment this into three main components or three stages. Um, and so what I decided to do was divide it into like, into logistics, compositional process and studio day. Okay. So I actually started with logistics, not the actual project itself. Right. So in other words, who's my band, right? Where am I going to record this composition? Um, how am I going to record this in a way that's in accordance with local and, you know, state and, and federal COVID-19 guidelines, right? We are in the middle of the pandemic. And then also on the back end. So once this recording is made, right, the job isn't done. It's got to be mixed. It's got to be mastered. And um, essentially, I also coordinated with uh, local media, particularly um, uh KUTV, local ABC, CBS affiliates, uh, to make sure that I was going to be able to maximize the promotional effect of my participation with the movie. So my first two days, actually, upon getting this commission, had nothing to do with composing <laughs> the music. 
essentially, right, I'm setting the stage for this project so that I can be creative. Um, and I think, you know, that transfers across, you know, a variety of different like business practices, right? Like don't start on the project, start by making sure that you have all of the tools necessary, like networking and um, like structure in place so that you can create in a space that's going to be supportive and conducive to your work, okay? Then, okay, essentially on the, the on two days later, I started composing. Now, to be honest, I mean, that compositional process did start pretty much immediately because, you know, I'm listening to the, you know, that music and those themes, right? I'm listening to it, right? But I'm not actively composing. I'm working on logistics during that first two days. But my mind is running in the background, right? Like, I mean, at this point in my career, right? I can hear, right? I can hear like the voice in my head. You know what I mean? Like the muse is telling, you know, is running through ideas, right? Um, and like, perhaps more importantly, right? Like, what do I want to present out of this? Like, I know the main themes of the movie. I know, um, like, I, I mean, you know, jo Jonathan Batiste, right? Like is coming out of New Orleans and, and I used to live in New Orleans. Um, you know, we have, we know a lot of people in common. Um, and in fact, the bass player that I, um, I work with here in Salt Lake also plays in uh, Jonathan's band, the, the Stay Human band. So I even had someone like who was a part of um, the, the soul sessions that Jonathan was on as a part of my band. Um, but essentially um, on day three, I started the compositional process, synthesizing influences, and deciding what do I want to present an, as an artist in this medium. Um, and to do that, I always start by um, essentially uh, away from the instrument and essentially what I call like scratch tracks. Um, I'd love to just play you a couple of clips of them. Um, I whistle, I sing, sometimes I'll, I'll work with my instrument, sometimes I'll work at the piano, right? But essentially, I'm just trying to like create a repository of ideas that I can edit down into the final product, right? So I'm just throwing a bunch of stuff at the at the wall, seeing what sticks and seeing what I can turn into um, like a, a compositional nugget. So let me just play you a couple little clips here. Is this coming through okay? Can you guys hear this? Maybe uh, okay, cool. That was actually the very first recording I made for this, you know, for this process. Here's one more. Here we go. And, and, you know, this is just my voice recorder, guys. Like, this is nothing, like, that you guys can't literally do right now. Um, you know, you, you, I've got them labeled, like, scratch tracks. You know, you can see that this is all happening on December 20th. And um, I'm just trying to, you know, trying to search, right, for, for material that I think that I can turn into a viable composition. <laughs> Oh, 
Okay. So next thing I did was fail, actually, <laughs> pretty hard. I took a stab at writing the tune. And um, for the first time, like I tried to commit to like, you know what I mean? A musical notation for this uh, for this product. Let me see if I can find it here. In the meantime, I had come up with this super cool introduction. And to be quite honest, like I was forcing it. So like I had this idea in my head that I was going to take a, um, like a really famous jazz composition uh, from this saxophonist that I'm influenced by, Sonny Rollins. And I was going to try and like take the melodic rhythm of his tune, but fit a new set of notes over it. And it just didn't work, just did, <laughs> did not work. Um, and so, you know, I started really sweating, to be perfectly honest, because that was day three, right? And I had two, like two more days, including recording the composition to finish, right? So I woke up on day four, and I went back to the drawing board, essentially, like went back through my old recordings that I had made, you know, the day before, um, did some more, uh, like playing at my saxophone, at the piano, um, and trying to really think about, you know, the difference between the day before, right? Trying to force something that didn't quite work, right? Because like intellectually, I wanted to make it work and something that was like coming from the heart, quite frankly, right? Like something that like I, that was um, still like, still informed, right? By all of my knowledge, right? But like something that really like, was coming from a different place, right? In terms of like my experience. Um, and what I ended up coming up with, okay, was this. And this is what we ended up using to record in the studio. So like what you're seeing here is an exact representation of the entire track for soul. And that's because um, what I needed to do, right, was give my like musicians, right, I'm playing with other people at the end of the day, needed to give them an exact representation of like the template that they were going to be working within, right? Because anytime you're collaborating with other people, right, if you don't give them a specific set of guidelines and expectations to work within, um, then you can't control your product, right? So um, essentially, I gave them this template, this, and, um, you know, you're probably sitting there thinking, like, you know, this doesn't, like, sound, like, how is this going to work, maybe? Like, those sounds, right? Maybe, like, you can't imagine how the band is going to turn that into music, right? Um, but essentially, right, like, knowing the right people, right? Having networked up to this point, knowing um, in my head, right? What I write versus how that's going to be realized in a performance situation led to the final product, which you can hear here.
So to conclude, all right, let me just put a little, nice little bow tie on this for, for us this evening. I just wanted to put together just a short list, a short term, a medium term and a long term goal that I think no matter where you're coming from, you can, you can do these three things for yourself that is going to result in advancement, right, in terms of if it's a business opportunity, if it's your brand, um, or just in terms of how you want other people to see you in a professional space, right? Short term, something that you can start to do even tonight, digital pruning, right? What are the things that you have out there right now that you don't want people to see, right? What are the things that perhaps don't serve you anymore, right? Like maybe like two years ago, that was something you wanted out there, maybe you don't now, right? For me, like, I know that I went back through at a certain point in my career and pulled back recordings that I didn't feel like were really representative of me, right? Um, or, you know, um, yeah, I mean, I'm sure we can think of things that we don't want in a digital space that we could pull back um, to just, you know, essentially not uh, have a, a misalignment between who we are now and who we were. A good medium term goal, holistic cultivation of your professional website and your social media platforms, right? What are the things that you want people to find? And the iceberg, you know, tip of the iceberg effect, make sure that you keep into lanes with your different platforms, right? We don't want, you know, essentially one post fits all across all of our platforms because essentially people will stop looking at your stuff. Long-term goal, when opportunities come your way, build plateaus into your project so that it can support your visibility on multiple fronts simultaneously. Um, I did this, uh, for instance, with uh, the, the presence project that I showed you earlier. And actually I ended up hiring um, a, a current student from University of Utah and a former student from University of Utah um, as a part of the band, the university ended up picking up the story uh, of Soul, and essentially I got to sort of double dip the chip. Like I got a whole bunch of kudos as an educator, right? But I was initially hired as a composer and performer, right? And so I kind of fulfilled all three components, right, of, of like the career um, vision, right, like that I have for myself in terms of visibility, all with one project. Okay, um, so especially as you, you start to get deeper into your career, you can think about those collaborations, those opportunities uh, to connect with other brands, with other companies, um, and uh, with other elements of your branding, uh, both as a person and a business um, to, you know, kind of take you even farther with one project. Okay. So I'm going to end it there. Thank you all so much for your patience and your time this evening. Um, 
I know that as a musician, I can kind of bounce around and, you know, sort of, you know, go from, from one, uh, one area to the next. So thank you for sticking with me. And um, again, thank you to the Heinz Center for Entrepreneurship uh, and to my host this evening who made this uh, collaboration possible. Thank you very much.